Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Mark Anthony's Music Picks. Today is episode 110, and this is going to be a part two to a series that I did, I believe, last summer. It was the uh, the one where I was wearing my my crazy shirt. The, the Detroit House Classics series is back for part two, and I have five more picks for you today that I feel are classics from the Detroit House scene. One of the things that I love about the Detroit producers is the fact that they create their own signature sound. All of these guys have their own signature sound. And for the most part, they keep it the same as they roll through the years. And <clears throat> I talked about this before, but I really like it when producers have a sound, they spend time refining it, and then they stick with it and just find different ways to branch off of it rather than chasing all the different trends. When you chase trends as a producer, you just sort of, to, you know, for people that are watching from a distance, it just looks like you're just kind of blown wherever the wind takes you. And to me, that makes the music that those people produce a little bit less sincere because it makes me question whether or not they're creating it because it's a sound that they like or they're creating it because it's a sound that will continue to get them gigs and allow them to maintain their megastar status, right? If, if you have a particular sound and you stick with it, you take the chance of not getting booked as much or not selling as many mp3s or vinyls and i like the guys that are okay with that i like the guys that stick to their guns so the detroit guys do and today like i said i have five picks for you and i hope you enjoy them first one is a group that i know i'll start off right from the get i know very little about this this gang and this is underground resistance Underground Resistance is a Detroit-based collective that I guess has a some sort of political affiliation or political leanings. I don't really want to get into that. Not honestly, I don't really care what their what their political or social stances are. I'm more interested in the music. I only have one Underground Resistance record in my entire collection. So this is obviously an admitted gap for me in my collection and I'm hoping that some of the old school heads on this channel that were you know, going to clubs and parties and raves in the 90s will be able to comment and maybe make some recommendations based on some of my taste and things that you've seen from me in other videos. But my pick, my, my only pick for Underground Resistance is Nation to Nation. And one of the things that I found interesting about this, when I saw the name Underground Resistance and I saw you know, some of the pictures of the guys that, that are in the gang, like they're, <clears throat> you know, they're kind of posing for pictures like, like a hip hop collective would, like Wu-Tang Clan or Public Enemy. And because of that, I thought that their sound was gonna be really dark and edgy. And then when I listened to Nation to Nation, it's it's very actually like a like festival outdoor rave kind of like open air atmosphere. I mean, there's a guy that's wailing away on the saxophone and playing in a way that's it, there's there's nothing dark and drab about it. Even though the pictures of the underground resistance members, you know, kind of are like sullen and 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 trying to create like like almost like an intimidating vibe. So it's like how intimidating can you be when you're wailing away on a saxophone and and, and making people smile and dance? So <laughs> I thought that was interesting. But Nation to Nation, it's like a five to six minute record. And one of the things I love about it, it came out in 1991. If you listen to this sample here, just listen when this acid line drops. And then imagine that coming through on some concert level surround sound speakers at, at a big open air event. This thing would absolutely crush.
next up is an artist that I've been following for heavily for probably the past five or six years. And when I first discovered him, I had to go back through his catalog because this man goes all the way back to at least 2003 when he started his own label called Mix Mode Recordings. Next up is Delano Smith, and I'm going to feature his Odyssey album here as a classic. Now, this is on Sushi Tech. You guys know I love Sushi Tech. Almost everything on that label is good. It's almost a blind buy label in my opinion. It's just got that steady, consistent, classic feel to it. It appeals to people that like Tech House. It appeals to people that like a little bit of techno. And anybody that's into dub techno probably has Sushi Tech Records too because it's sort of straddling the the line, the, the, the Venn diagram where all three of those realms meet. That's, that's what Sushi Tech is. And I think it's very appropriate to have Delano releasing on that label. And Delano has three triple pack albums out. He has this, he has Twilight, and he has the Detroit Lost Tapes. All of those have winning tracks on them, but this one has the most winners in my opinion. And there's a track on here that I absolutely love and I feel like it encapsulates Delano's sound very elo eloquently. It's called Inspiration. It's the E2 record on here. And one of the things that, when I listen to Delano's records, he sounds very Detroit and he sounds very refined. It, he's almost like a, like a hundred year old bottle of wine that only has a few simple ingredients. And because of those simple ingredients, it just comes out sounding so good. He has a signature, almost like sweeping smoothness to, to his synths. There's, there's something like I said, very refined and elegant about Delano's tracks. Like they have the punch and then they have the nice the nice sweeps that I'm talking about. And you'll hear them in the sample here. That that sweep is what Delano uses to lead a lot of his tracks. Like that's the hook. And I just absolutely love him for it. So Delano, please keep the productions coming. I love them. And I love that you stayed true to your sound over the years. Back in 2020, during the pandemic, right when COVID was really rolling and people were getting really sick and dying from it, unfortunately, Mike Huckabee was one of the Detroit producers that was affected by that. From what I understand, Mike either had a COVID, had COVID and then had a stroke or the other way around. I'm not sure which happened first, but when Mike Huckabee passed away, that was a huge loss for the scene. Mike is... When I look back at his catalog, he was one of those producers that just had like that that signature Detroit sound and he he found his element and he he generated these very thumpy almost like warehouse house tracks. Now, he Mike also had the ability to go soft and go a little bit more disco and deep house and he had the ability to go hard with warehouse bangers. The track that I want to present to you today is called The Rowdy Swing. It came out in 1997 and it was originally released on the Versatility EP on I think a label called M1. It was under his alias called Roland King. Now I 
I almost was able to get a copy of that, but after he passed away, the, the prices like doubled or tripled and I never was able to get one. But thankfully, Mike released this this classics compilation where it's basically uh, I guess he was saying there's too many too many classics to be to be left with little or no protection. And you can see that the Rowdy Swing is featured on here. And I absolutely love this track because of how raw it is. If you listen to the drum pattern in this, it reminds me of those really primitive early Chicago house tracks where the, <clears throat> where the drums were kind of in sync, but a little bit off, like they weren't perfectly quantized. And it was just like, you could tell it was somebody working it out of their living room. And one of my favorite things of above all else for when Mike Huckabee went hard was his kick drum. He had a perfectly tuned kick drum. He basically used the same kick more or less in all of his hard tracks. And when that thing hits, it's just got such like a roundness to it. When I... I went to see Mike Huckabee once. I got to see him live once, and I described the night out with Mike Huckabee in one of my episodes. So if you hang out to the end of this episode, I'll give you one of those little squares in the upper left corner where you can click on it, and it's my Mike Huckabee tribute episode where I d described the, the night that I had with him, and I went into great t detail about it, but um, it was something very memorable. I got to interact with him and talk with him for a little bit, and one of the things that I remember about him is how down-to-earth and how kind he was. He just chilled with you as if he were another fan hanging out in the crowd, and I really adored him for that. So, Mike, rest in peace. I'm so sorry you're gone, and thank you for all the tunes. Here's an artist that I've never talked about on this channel, Omar S. Omar S in the, let's say, late 2000s, before leading up to 2010, was really popular. I, I think he still does sell a lot of records, but there was definitely a moment where he was getting a lot of reviews, a lot of hype, and people were just talking about every release that he had. Up until now, I've only held on to two of his records that I, you know, really wanted to keep in my, in my collection, and this is one of them. This is his alias Oasis, and it's this kind of raw looking, it's just a raw looking white label called Detroit Number no. 1, and not too much going on. It, it kind of looks like a LaVon Vincent record, just with some stamping, and one of the interesting things about this plate is that when you play it, it's, it's single-sided, so it's, it's only got the cut on this side, but you have to actually drop the needle in the inner groove and it plays outward. I, I, I mean, that's a gimmick. Other, other records have it. It doesn't, doesn't really accomplish anything, but it, it's kind of interesting. But I, I really like the beat in this because, to me, it's like a take on Robert Hood's earlier minimal records from the mid to, to late 90s. Some of his first albums had very simplistic minimal rhythms in them. This one has that same type of vibe. It's haunted. It's creepy. The claps are kind of punchy and raw in um, almost like a primitive manner as if 
the the drum machine was intentionally unrefined for the production and i think that's why a lot of people like omar s records is because they're not all they're like the opposite if you remember when dead mouse hit the scene in, in 2007 everything was so smooth and perfectly curated and, and it was like so tight and perfect and omar s record is the like on the opposite end of the spectrum is in terms of refinement of the individual elements there there's always a rawness and like a it's like slightly out of sorts all the time and that's why i think this record really stands strong for this episode is another Detroit artist that I only have a few records from, but this one is really special to me. This is Kevin, Kevin Saunderson's remix of Who's Afraid of Detroit by Claude Von Stroke. Claude Von Stroke is the kingpin of Dirty Bird, and he started Dirty Bird, I think, in 2003. He's a Detroit person. And Who's Afraid of Detroit was kind of like a world, winter music conference superstar track it got a ton of different remixes and the kevin saunderson to me was a little bit overlooked it it came to me by way of danny howell's essential mix in 2007 which is one of my favorite mixes of all time i've i've talked about that a few times on my channel i have hammered that mix into oblivion i know it front to back inside and out i know every single track on it and the saunderson to me kind of captures the essence of that whole mix because there's a lot of tracks in that mix that have really interesting synth leads and I think the synth lead that Kevin used in here is just something that I've never heard in, in any other track. It's kind of got a, a vibrato type looseness. Almost, it almost makes you think that your speaker has a little bit of like a loose connection, but it's not. It's it's how it's how the synth is hitting. And I just thought it was really nice how Kevin made that synth turn into this like nice sweeping bright sunny day type vibe where you really just want to like listen to it and enjoy the fact that you're alive That's all for today's episode, guys. Stay tuned. I'm going to give you links to the Detroit Classics Volume 1, and I'm also going to give you a link to the Mike Huckabee tribute that I did. If any of these tracks reminded you of other Detroit House Classics, obviously comment them down below. I hope you enjoyed this, and take care.